Hey, what's up guys? My name is Channel. Welcome back to my series in which I remake my first game in C++. And I say that every time. Last episode, which was at the start of this week, just pumping these out. We fixed our blurry pixel problem. And I made that video as a whole to kind of show how I would approach debugging graphics related issues. So definitely check that out. But now, now that we have our sharp pixels, as you can see, very cool, very sharp pixels. And in fact, you can see that they're all, they're each three by three, because if, if you pay careful attention here, you can see how my little blurry uh, drawing tool thing. You can see how the colors are a bit different. So you can actually count the one, two, three pixels that each of our kind of pixels are because our scale is three. So that's all perfect. That's all set up. Now what we're ready to do, hopefully, is to look at the Java version uh, and actually start implementing this kind of renderer. This kind of pixel renderer that will actually render all of these guys, which also should be like three by three pixels. Which actually, now that I'm zooming in here, it kind of looks like they're 4x4. Four four. Isn't that strange? Oh well. Yeah, they seem to be 4. Hmm. But anyway, we can now start actually implementing this kind of renderer, and that's what we're going to do today. So as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the series, I want to kind of replicate this pretty much one for one, like as closely as possible to the original version. I will probably improve some technical details because of course this was like my first game and I will probably also like make it resizable and all of that stuff but I'm going to try and essentially port the game into C++. So if we look at the screen.java file, by the way the repositories will be in the description below. I haven't actually made any commits for this actual game yet that we're working on because it's basically just random pixels at this point in time. I probably will maybe after this episode but Genesis, like the original Genesis game, that is on GitHub and I'll have a link in the description below so you can actually browse the, the Java code and even play the game if you want. But basically if we have a scroll through this class, this is what we're interested in implementing. Um, I should probably go over the architecture a little bit. Basically, game.java, the game class, this is kind of like the main, the main class, I guess, of this entire game. And what happens is inside the render function, well, there's two kind of main functions here. There's an update function, which will, you know, update things, and, and level.update is really like the, the main meat of where the game actually gets updated. Uh, and then we have... Uh, inside the render function, we have level.render. And you can see that takes in a screen object over here, which is an instance of that screen class we looked at. And the reason it does that is because the level itself will go through like the area on the screen that we can actually see, right? So the visible kind of boundary, because the level could be, you know, massive, but obviously we're just kind of looking into a window of that level. And that's what all these guys are determining, that kind of clipping area that we can actually see here that we need to render. And then we'll go through that area that we can see and get every tile by its index so that we know what type of tile it is. So that'll be like one of these squares. And then we'll call tile.render passing in the screen. And so when we do that, we pass in the screen class, you can see there's nothing in here because they're actually all kind of subclasses. Now, I don't think we're going to set it up this way. This is like a very object oriented approach and I definitely wouldn't do it this way just because it's a complete not not because there's like anything i think too bad with performance here i mean yeah having like you know an overridden function for every single tile that you want to render is is an unnecessary like extra indirection to go through to find the right you know function via the v table and all of that but the i would say the real hassle is having to create a separate class for every tile type like that's just very unnecessary you could set this all up to essentially be tile and then just set some parameters so for example a stone tile uh you know what does it do for rendering this which is pretty much what every single tile does maybe there are some exceptions but most of them do this and then for solid it returns true so why not put this into the base class and then just make like some kind of uh boolean in the actual tile class that's whether or not it's solid. And then that way you can ask the tile, is it solid? For that instance, it would be true. You know what I mean? Like instead of actually creating a new class for it that just implements some data, you can just store the data in the actual class, like in that instance of the class. Um, and of course we don't even need to use class instances if we really kind of think about it, but whatever. Um, and you can see they also, we, we do actually set some data here, thankfully, we set the sprite. So just like we set the sprite to be something specific, right? Um, we could also, you know, just be like, yeah, by the way, this is solid. <laughs> and then we wouldn't need that whole like solid false and then, you know, overridden to return true, which is a bit weird, but whatever. 
Um, okay, so if we go into like stone class, for example, you can see it does screen around a tile. It like will basically multiply that X because that's a tile coordinate by 16 to get up to like pixel space. So we know which pixels to kind of start from. That's like the coordinate X pixel, Y pixel. We'll subtract the offset from it. And what the offset is, is kind of like where the player is, where we should render it from. Because the way it's rendered is the player is supposed to be in the middle. So therefore there's going to be some offset. That's essentially like the camera, I guess. And that's what happens here. And then we'll go through the actual size of the sprite which is 16 so this stuff is 16 by 16 pixels we'll go through that and then we'll potentially clip it over here but otherwise we'll translate because uh, you can see this goes from 0 to 15 right this for loop will go from 0 to 15 to cover all the pixels of the sprite however we need to put them somewhere into the screen buffer and that's obviously going to be at an offset depending on where the actual tile appears on the screen so that's what this int yt is that's kind of offsetting the uh, actual kind of pixel inside the sprite by the position of the tile so that we get it in that kind of you know context of being on screen um, because we need to kind of I guess transform it onto the right position on the screen. Uh, if it's like less than zero, like set it to zero. So just doing like some clipping here, essentially. I don't really know if we need this. It's just because this was a bit weird, right? I mentioned this, I think, in either the code review or maybe, yeah, some video. I think probably the code review um, where this was basically like instead of being zero, for some reason, I made it kind of be one tile back, I guess, because this will be negative 16. Uh, but then because that will obviously crash because we can't read negative 16 from here, we have to then, um, I guess, clip it to zero because this could end up being negative, I guess. And that would be an array index out of bounds exception. I don't know. It's a bit weird. You can also see that if the tile isn't a torch tile, we actually change the brightness of the color depending on the, on the brightness of the torch. So that's also important. That's kind of our lighting <laughs> that needs to happen. We need to change the brightness. Um, but yeah, that's overall like the rendering. So you can see what we're doing. We're basically just copying pixels from the actual sprite onto like the screen. That's what's happening here. We read the sprite pixels and we copy them into the relevant offset into the kind of screen buffer. And that's how that works. So inside our C++ code, we know that we have, uh, we have image data, which is essentially that buffer, right? And we have an image, which we then kind of set over here. So image set data is kind of the same thing as what happens in the game class um, over here. So this copying the pixels from the screen pixels into our pixels, which is actually like the data buffer of the image, you can see that there's, it's very kind of analogous to like the actual C++ code. We also have an image and we have that data buffer. That's the same thing as this image and this image data. And then this kind of act of, I, again, I, I mentioned this before, but I don't know if, I don't know why exactly this is actually copying it, considering we could have just given it a reference, I guess, of that. But that's basically what's happening here. This is essentially image set data. And then over here, G dot draw image, that's basically where we draw it here with I'm GUI. Like we're just drawing it using Java's graphics here and I'm GUI here. So that's pretty cool. It's very, very similar. So now all we really have to do is actually render something into these pixels. But I think what we don't have to do here, which we did in the Java version is screen actually creates like its own pixels array. Well, it has a tiles array pixels equals new in it with times height. So we actually have two buffers in the Java version. We have like one that we get from the image, which is this, and then one that we actually allocate ourselves. But in our version, we don't, we don't need that. We just have this guy, which is the actual image and then image data, which is what gets kind of uploaded to the GPU to actually be rendered. All right. So we're pretty much ready to, I guess, start implementing this screen class. And then maybe, maybe we should also try reading in some kind of image so that we can render like a sprite on the screen. That'll be pretty exciting. Now, if you're new to computer science and you want to learn some math as well, I highly recommend you check out the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. What Brilliant is, is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of courses on various STEM topics. They have some really, really good introductory computer science stuff that will really help you kind of think as a programmer. And also my personal favorite is their math stuff because their math stuff goes very deep, very advanced, and it's presented in such a beautiful visual and interactive way. Like you have these widgets you can play with, they quiz you constantly to make sure that you're actually learning the content. It's just such a beautiful, engaging way to learn that I find is fun 
manageable because each kind of individual class is bite sized so you can kind of get through it rather quickly even if you don't have much time and also really effective because the way they teach you know visually and interactively just works so well now brilliant have actually expanded their trial up to 30 days now so if you go to brilliant.org slash the channel you can try them for free for 30 days just browse through their courses and see how you go there's no reason not to try it out and then if you really enjoy it brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 of my subscribers 20 percent off an annual membership huge thank you as always to brilliant for being a fantastic sponsor on my channel all right so my strategy is going to be um yeah i'm actually kind of now that i'm thinking about this there's probably almost no no point in actually creating this screen class if we can't we do have a clear function which clears everything to black that's exciting but other than that like we need sprites to draw don't we so let's take a look at the sprite class quickly we have a sprite class which has a bunch of static instances of like itself right and then we have these kind of cryptic looking numbers here but really what they are are an x and y coordinate within a sprite sheet and a size i presume right so x and y you can see gets multiplied by 16 here as well so that we um kind of treat this as a coordinate rather than a pixel offset um, and then create will basically copy. Okay, so each sprite contains its own pixels buffer. Okay, so this is also a bit un unnecessary, right? Because what this is, is it, so every sprite will contain its own pixel buffer, which is 16 by 16 pixels. And then the way we kind of create it is we copy it from sprite sheet.pixels, which presumably sprite sheet, yeah, is just basically going to load like the image that is the sprite sheet, which contains all of the sprites. Um, and that'll be the entire sprite sheet, but then also we copy it so that each sprite has its own individual array. Again, completely unnecessary because anytime we want to render the sprite, we could just use these existing pixels. Like there's no reason for us to kind of create, I guess, this many, <laughs> this many, wow, there's a lot of sprites, this many separate buffers just to render each sprite if they're all contained kind of globally, you know, inside this sprite sheet. And if we actually look at the sprite sheet, which is over here, um, I'll kind of zoom in here, you can see that um, this is kind of what the sprites look like. They're all packaged into a single sprite sheet. Now, this is actually very good. This is going to be really, really useful to us because when later in the series we move this to actually be rendered, you know, hardware accelerated, like on the GPU using Vulkan, this is very helpful because we can just have one texture. Instead of trying to create, you know, like, I don't know, 20 different textures, one for each sprite, and then having to, you know, either bind them into different texture slots or even draw the sprites in different draw calls, like, instead of doing all of that, we can just have them all in one texture, uh, and then that's it. We just set that texture onto the GPU, we upload the data, and then we can kind of reference, like, a sub-image from it which basically just means that when it's time for us to sample a particular sprite, we obviously just set the texture coordinates to be like, you know, this range. Um, and of course, we'll get into that when we actually do the, the vulcanizing, the GPU part. Okay, so I think actually, I'm going to kind of go backwards here. Instead of implementing the screen class, let's actually try and load a sprite. Uh, and then we'll do the screen class at least enough, I think, today. We should be able to have time um, to actually render something and see it. So let's kind of try and work quickly here. Now, the cool thing is we do have an image class uh, inside of Walnut. And the image class um, obviously will load stuff. It will load a texture or an image from a path using STBI, STB image. Um, and then what it will do is it will set it onto the GPU. Now, we don't want that in this case. We don't, we don't actually want this to be set onto the GPU. So I'm wondering if maybe it, will be, it would make sense for us to modify Walnut and allow Walnut for us to kind of do local storage only in a way. So what that means is don't upload it to the GPU, just keep the data on the CPU, that's all I want. Um, should we do that? Because the alternative is basically we don't do that. And instead what we do is we just use STB image ourselves inside Genesis, inside the game to just load, you know, the data and that's it. So I don't know. Um, let me know if you guys want to see me modify Walnut like in this series at all. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, but it would be a useful function to have. It's just obviously image is very heavily kind of tied with the GPU as well. So it might be, might be a little bit of, of work. Um, now STB image, I think it's really, the, the other problem though is I don't know if Genesis actually includes the include path for this. It probably doesn't. So if we look at the, yeah, I think we'll just do it manually to be completely honest. Um, like as in we'll use STB image ourselves. That's kind of what you get to see here, me making all these decisions live because I haven't planned any of this. This is all kind of happening naturally. Uh, so inside, would it be, I guess in the pre-make for Genesis, um, if we kind of go back here and we open up the pre-make for Walnut, 
This is probably going to include, um, or maybe it's in dependencies. So Walnut external. Okay, let's kind of look at this. What's Walnut external? So include directory. Does it include? It has to include the, the directory for STB image, right? Because otherwise, like, where is STB image located? Oh, maybe it's just in. Let's just see. No, it's in vendor stb image. So this has to be, stb image has to be an include directory. Okay, well, if we look at Walnut's property pages, we can actually see that stb image is included here. Um, but I'm not sure what premake is actually doing that. It's got to be like the Walnut premake, right? Isn't this what I looked at before? Or did I look at Walnut app? No. Oh, I was in Walnut and I looked, at, I looked at this, but I didn't look at the actual Walnut one. Okay, here it, here it is. So you can see vendor STB image is being included here. So what we can do is we can just copy this, basically. And then if we go into... Um, and there's there might be better ways to set this up, like possibly by having a separate dependencies.lua file or something like that, just to kind of keep them all in one place. But if we go into the premake um, and we actually take a look at Genesis... So if we go into like the Genesis premake, which is over here, um, then just like we include all this stuff, we can also include, it'll be Walnut, I think, vendor, STB image. And because the implementation is already defined here, so you can see when we include it here, we define STB image implementation. That means that this image.cpp file, which compiles into like image.obj, which is like the actual compiled code, that will contain this. So Walnut builds into a static library which contains STB images uh, implementation, which means we of course don't need to implement it here inside Genesis. And if we do, it'll probably tell us that we have multiply defined symbols. So what we can do here, I guess, is we can add a new, um, now is this just like, what's the file structure here? Yeah, okay. So inside source, I'll add a new item here. We might want to move this out a bit, but I'll just call it Sprite Sheet. So I'll copy the Java version for now. Um, that's the kind of fun stuff. That's the fun thing about making a game. <laughs> we can just actually make the game and not worry about like, oh, how do we make this like all generalized and stuff? I guess I'll do namespace Genesis, which I haven't, haven't been doing yet, but that would be nice. Um, and so we'll just say uh, class, I was almost going to type public class sprite shit like in Java. Uh, we'll take in uh, cons std file system path. We'll include file system. Is that... Oh, what am I doing? File system path path. Um, I guess we can have a destructor. We'll see if we make that do anything though. Let's implement these guys just using visual assist. Uh, and I guess we can like keep track of what the path is. That might be useful for like debugging. I don't think we'll realistically need that. Um, but like for the actual game, but we can still kind of keep track of that. So I'll just set it over here. Um, okay, and then we'll just load it using STB image. So we should have that include directory set up, hopefully. Kind of doesn't look like it is. Okay, it's not. Oh, I didn't regenerate the things. So if we go back to Genesis um, remake here into our root directory rerun setup, that will hopefully uh, add that in. And if we control F7 the file, now it should work. Beautiful. Um, okay, and now we need to load it. So what does the Java version do? It just loads the image and it keeps it just keeps the pixels here. And there's also a fixed size for some reason. I don't think there needs to be a fixed size, but sure. Um, now, if we open up this sprite thing, the problem is I can't... I don't know if Eclipse... How do I just open the show in? No. Open with... Open... How do I just view the file location for this? It's just complete. Oh, look, there's a URL. Let me just grab that directory. <laughs> um, okay, so surprise.png. I guess we'll copy all the assets at this point in time. Um, and we'll copy them into over here, into our kind of um, Genesis remake over here. This is the root directory, but inside the project, I'll make a folder called res, resources, which will contain everything. So everything should be relative to this because this should be our working directory at this point in time. Um, so it's just res slash sprites.png will be the, the path. Uh, and then we'll just kind of, let's go back to like maybe Genesis app uh, and we'll try and just kind of already start writing the code that loads it. So if we include sprite sheet, let's do like, um, sure, we can do a shared pointer. 
Genesis sprite sheet. I'll probably make this file inside the Genesis namespace in the future. Actually, we should probably move this out, um, but I'll just call this sprite sheet. And then um, let's do sprite sheet equals se make sure sprite sheet, and we'll do res slash sprites.png. So there's our sprite sheet. Um, now we have to obviously load it. So if we go back to walnut image to see how we would use stb image to load it, this will just be quicker. Um, so it's not going to be an HDR, it's just going to be a normal kind of um, RGBA, I guess, or even an RGB texture. So this is what it is. So um, let's just copy this line. We'll go back to our sprite sheet. Uh, we'll kind of keep a buffer of pixels here, which I don't know. I guess we can just do U and eight T. Would we want? Okay. So the thing is, no. I guess we'll just make the thirty two T. What we can do with SCB image, by the way, is we can force it to have four channels. So even if the image itself is only RGB, uh, it's actually going to pad it out so that it is um, kind of four channels, one byte per channel, so we have four bytes per pixel. The reason why that's useful is because that means each pixel is this data type. You can't really have a 24-bit data type. Um, I mean, you can if you really wanted to, but we don't kind of have one as default. So uh, because of that, it's just better to kind of pad it out, I guess. It'll just be easier to deal with. We could just also store them all as just this, and then just know that it'll be like, for example, three bytes between pixels if it's RGB. But I think this will probably be easier. Um, so I'll just call this pixels. Now, the thing is, yeah, I mean, I'm going to just allocate this on the heap, I guess. Uh, but you probably could also do it on the stack. Will it fit? Probably, because it's just, well, it's not that big. Although 256 by 256 by 4 is probably big. <laughs> so maybe you wouldn't want to do that. Because um, you only have about a megabyte of stack space, and I probably don't want it to be taken up by this. So we can just do pixels. If we're sure we know the size of it, which I'm going to say we don't, we'll allocate it later ourselves, and we'll make sure we delete it here. Now, I did see a comment. Someone was saying you can use a vector for this. I'm aware you can use a vector for this. What you can do is you can kind of just make a vector like that. And then you can just obviously do, when you know the size, you can just do resize, and then it will um, kind of resize the vector, reallocate the vector to be that certain size. And then you can use dot data to get like the raw pointer for it. I honestly just don't always like doing that. And the, the only benefit of doing that, by the way, really is, um, I guess you know the size of it, because you can ask it what the size is, pixels.size. Uh, that's a that's an that's a good benefit, but then also you don't have to delete it because when you know this vector is allocated on the stack and like the data is on the heap, but it will delete the data on the heap in the in the destructor of the actual vector, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know. I there's no real difference. I don't mind doing it the raw way because, like you know, as long as you just remember to delete it, it's probably fine. Um, but if you want to do it the vector way, then Sure, do it the vector way. So um, pixels will kind of just be this. Now, oh yeah, I should mention that. So you should probably use STBI free, or what is it, STB free? STB image free, I think, right? All right, we can look at Walnut to see what it does. So what does release do? Or well, actually, what does it even do? STB image free, yeah. Isn't that what I wrote? Yeah. That does look like what I wrote. So we can do that. I don't know why that's not uh, defined. Oh, it's STBI image free. Okay. Um, okay, so the path we put in here. Now, yeah, the annoying thing is it wants a C string. So what we actually have to do is file path string is path.string, which will convert it from wide characters to normal characters. And then we have to do this, which is a little bit annoying. Now, with height, I guess we can store here. Now, what is this? This is an int. So we can just store it as an int because otherwise it might be upset at us. I'll initialize these to zero. Always a good idea to initialize these things. Pass doesn't need to be initialized because it's a class, so it'll automatically be initialized. Um, so width, height. Now channels, um, it probably doesn't matter if we say what our desired channels are. So if we pass in zero here, it will tell us what the channels are. So just for curiosity, we can actually leave this in here. Um, now what's this upset with? Yeah, so what is it, stbuc, what does that return, stbiuc, so stbi unsigned char is what that is, so that's actually a one byte format, but we can cast it to something else if we want to, um, and then it will just treat it as the kind of 32 bit one, uh, integers that we want to treat it as. Now why are you upset? 
Oh, I'm casting it to this. That's not what I meant. <laughs> it's that. I'm trying to cast it to this. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm interested to kind of, if we just do a debug break here, which is kind of Windows only, but it's temporary. Um, I'm just going to use this to just see what the channels are. It'll probably be three. And if we pass in zero here, um, then it will not assume anything. If we tell it something, then it will, in fact, set it to like B4, uh, four bytes per pixel or four channels. Um, and I guess because they're going to be not like floating point, they'll be one byte per channel. But if we just, I guess if we just run that, because Genesis app loads that, right? Let's try and run that. All right. So let's see. Uh, channels, yeah, three, right? Um, and so that's fine. But we're going to put in four here. So we'll just actually pad it out to be um, RGBA, I guess. Uh, and in that case, we probably don't need channels. Can we just pass in null? Is that valid? Or is it going to try and write to that no matter what? Load from file. I don't know if I want to keep digging through this to be completely honest. Yeah, so you can actually see this is the number of channels that it writes out. It seems to only write it out if it's not null. That's what this if check does. So I guess if you if you really don't care, you can actually pass in null uh, and you'll be right. So I'll do that to keep it a bit cleaner. Okay, cool. There's our pixels. Now, if that didn't work, we can probably like report an error or something. So if pixels didn't work, um, you know, could not load image path, okay? Or could not load sprite sheet. So that'll just be useful to us in case it doesn't work. Uh, and then I'm assuming this will be fine because pixels will be null. So this is just checking if it's null. Uh, and if it's null, we'll print out an error message. Um, but I'm assuming this should be okay with null because it's just calling free. So that'll be fine. You can free null and it won't do anything. Um, okay, great. So we have that. Uh, now, just like we had over here, actually in the Java version, we may have just had, yeah, this was just public and it was in fact static as well. Um, so we can make this public, but we can also just, you know, get pixels, make a little function called get pixels and then have that return pixels. And then I guess we can have get width and get height. So we can have some of these getters um, and setters here, which to be honest, I usually like, it's not that I avoid them. If you have both getters and, and setters, you should just make the variable public. But if you only, if you kind of have it as a read only thing, which is what we're doing, then um, it's probably better to just uh, write it like this. Okay, beautiful. So we have a sprite sheet, we have the pixels. Um, we should now be able to render something. Um, now, I think we'll end up implementing like the screen class properly next episode, just because this is already dragging on. But uh, I think what I will do is I'll try and load like a specific sprite, I guess. And we could even make like a little system here so that we could index the sprites properly and just ask for a specific sprite type, which could be could be useful, I guess. But um, what we'll do is we'll we'll try and like render a sprite, I guess, over here uh, by just copying it essentially from the sprite sheet. So let's find a sprite that we want to render. Um, if we go into res sprites, okay. So I guess we'll render the player. So this is the player. We'll render this guy over here. So that's going to be from the I guess bottom of the image is where we'll index it from. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight on the Y and two on the X. So two, eight is what we want to render. So how do we do that? Well, we can get the pixels. Let's just get a pointer to sprite sheet pixels. Um, and then let's think about this. So to in order for us to uh, offset ourselves into the right kind of coordinate, we need to... Okay, well, let's write out the coordinate first. I'll try and make this as clear as possible. So x is 2, y is 8. That's our coordinate. So step one is let's convert this into pixels. What is the pixel offset both in x and y? So that's going to be um, int xp, I'll say, 2 times the size of each sprite, which is 16. So let's make a sprite size variable. Let's do 2 times 16. Oh, no, sorry, not 2 times 16. x times 16 times 16, right? So we're using the coordinate here. And then y times sprite size. So that gets us into, um, what am I doing? yp equals that. Writing two variables per line here. Very cool. Um, so we've got the, we've got the pixel 
like coordinate now. So now we have to use that as an index into here. But it also gets complicated a little bit here because when we actually read this, and I want to see how I did it here. Yeah, so you can see what happens is when we loop through this in order to copy it, we actually have to, so we, we read just x and y, which is from 0 to 15, that makes sense. But then in here, we do x plus, we kind of have to go through each coordinate um, because what you have to realize is that like when you're within a sprite sheet and you have a coordinate here, it's not just like you go from this coordinate because if you go from this coordinate, you'll just go straight. So what you still need to do is you need to make sure when you get to the edge, you start going onto the second kind of scan line, if that makes sense because it's going to be kind of, and I'll be from bottom to top, but you can, you kind of have to stop here, even though the texture obviously doesn't stop here. So it's not just about getting to the right place, you know, vertically, it's also about kind of wrapping around. Um, but if you do it this way, that will candle it for you because you'll have the kind of, um, this dot X will be the sprite in this case, that will be the coordinate within the sprite sheet, the offset, the starting offset within the sprite sheet. So over here, and then because you're doing X and Y plot, because these are all kind of individual coordinates, when you get to the end here, which is going to be 15 on X, you'll go to the next Y level and you'll go back to zero, which means you go back to the start. So that's actually going to work fine. Um, so if we'll, if we copy that, what we'll do is we'll write essentially this loop. So from, actually I can just copy it. Flat out, just copy it. So size uh, is going to be our sprite size. This can remain the same. Um, I'll say XC for this, which just stands for X coordinate, just so that we don't conflict with X and Y here. And then what we'll do is um, basically to access the sprite that we're looking for at a particular coordinate, this is us accessing the actual like color of that pixel. So I'll just say color. Um, that's going to be just move this a bit more. That's going to be the same thing as it was here. So x plus this dot x. So in this case, x will be one of these guys. So it's going to be x plus, and then this dot x is going to be xp. So that's where within the sprite sheet we want to be at. And x is actually the kind of within the sprite, if that makes sense. I know this might be a little bit confusing. I'll maybe try and draw this. But xp is our position within the sprite sheet. So this is going to be like, say, this dot here and remember xp is constant across this entire these entire for loops what changes in these for loops are x and y which is the kind of sprite coordinate so from 0 to 16 or 0 to 15 inclusive right so what we'll do I'll draw it in blue here is we get that starting coordinate of the sprite and then we start adding well the first iteration we just add zero to it right so we just add zero to it so we grab that pixel that's the color and then we'll go forward horizontally until we do that 16 times well all the way up to 15 and then we drop you know y plus plus happens we drop y is now one which means we go up one row and x is back to zero so we go here and i'll draw this in orange this is our second row now and then we go through and do that so that's what this is doing. It's just offsetting the XP, which is our actual kind of starting position of the sprite, by X, which is the value from 0 to 15. That's the pixel within the sprite, I guess, that we're trying to copy. Lots of stuff going on. Um, okay, and then, of course, we need to do that for Y as well. So YP plus Y. And we multiply this by the um, width of our sprite sheet. So sprite sheet get width. And the reason why is because you can see this is a, this is like a one dimensional array, but we're treat, we're trying to treat it with like two dimensional coordinates. So the way we do that is when we have our Y coordinate, we multiply it by the width so that we get to the row that we're after. So if this was the sprite sheet, um, you can see that if I want to get to like, you know, let's just say we have all these rows here. If I want to get to this row over here, to the starting point of this row over here, what do I do? Well, if it's single dimension, we know the width of the row. Let's just say it's like, well, it's 256, right? So if I want to get to this guy, it's going to be, this is going to be the coordinate to 256 or the index 256, because this is zero to 255, right? And similarly, this is going to be 256 to 511, which means this is 512. And so how can I get there? Well, I know that's row two. So two times 256 is what? 512, right? So it just helps us kind of get to the right row. Uh, and then within the row, we just add this offset. So you can see the multiplication really happens here. So this is what gets multiplied with the width, not this. This just gets added on later. 
That's why it's important for us to have these brackets here, because we don't want to do y times that. We want to do yp plus y, which is the complete kind of coordinate, uh, or the pixel coordinate, times the width. Um, and then we add this on. So if this was like, I don't know, the x coordinate was like 5, halfway through the, well, not halfway through the row, but a bit into the row, um, then of course it would just move it like to here, and that's it. So that's how that kind of offset works. Hopefully that made sense. Um, kind of rush through that. <laughs> okay, so we have the color. We have the color. We have the value that we want to kind of copy. Now we just need to decide where inside this image buffer do we place it. Now, um, what we could do is place it right into the middle. So let's try to do that. Um, so nine, uh, well, 960 by 540 we can't really trust because it'll be resized. So let's just say the middle, um, let's do it up here. So middle uh, x <laughs> will be image get width divided by 2. Uh, and then image get height divided by 2 will be the middle y. So if we basically grab the um, xt, x target, lots of like little acronyms and variable names here, what we can do is we can say that it's going to be middle x, but we'll subtract half of the sprite size. So what that's going to do is obviously start it up. Um, you know, if this is the very middle, of the actual display, it's going to move it back by the by half the sprite size so that we actually get it properly rendering in the middle. Um, we'll do the same thing for Y. Um, okay, and now we have our starting target X and Y, which by the way can totally be done up here. Uh, no need to do that inside the for loop. And then we'll actually put the pixels into the image. So that's going to be inside image data. We'll copy in at uh, XT plus x, because that's the actual, that's which pixel we're copying, whereas xt is just like the starting coordinate. So again, we have that starting coordinate, and then the x, which changes according to the for loop, lets us kind of expand it into this area, right? Um, and each iteration of the for loop, for loop copies one color, copies one pixel. And then this will be times the uh, image get width. So we'll set that equal to color. And that's it. That should be it. So I'm very excited. Let's hit F5 and hopefully this will work. Okay, so <laughs> so we got the wrong sprite, but it does look like we did get a sprite. I wonder why we got the wrong sprite. Would have been funny if you guys just saw me completely mess up. So we got the lion. So uh, maybe it's counting counting from the top. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, yeah, that would be the lion. So, it's, so it is going from the top interesting. Okay, well, let's try and set that to 7. I wonder why it's going from the top. And there's our player. Alright, beautiful. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, why it's going from the top is a bit of a mystery to me. Um, I would have expected it to go from the bottom, especially because everything else seems to... I guess everything else doesn't matter, though. But it's possible that it's just because when we load this, um, maybe STBI loads images that way. I know there's like a flip vertical vertical on load or whatever. STBI set flip vertically on load. And if we do that, I think we'll get the line here. Um, and we'll get the line upside down, in fact, uh, which makes sense. So we'll obviously leave that off and then we'll just count it from the top, I guess. So there you go. I learned something. Um, now, w one last thing we'll do today is uh, you can see that we have this pink background, which is a bit annoying, right? Um, and clearly the pink is supposed to be alpha. Now, why I didn't just make this uh, sprite sheet, which I keep losing, why I didn't make this sprite sheet just like RGBA, um, and then make this alpha is beyond me. I don't know why. Again, probably because I saw that Notch did it this way. <laughs> um, but that's totally fine as well. If you define a color, any color to be your transparent color or any two colors, like we have this kind of purple here, which I think is like um, probably like 7F007F. Um, and then this is FF00FF, right? Um, if you define these colors to be transparent, it's very easy to kind of implement that because all you do is you say that, hey, if the color is that color, so this will be a 24-bit color, obviously, um, but we only read that in, so this is probably going to be zero, to be honest. Uh, so if the color is, let's just try this, if the color is FF00FF, uh, then we can just say continue, because that's a transparent color, right? Or the alternative would have been, um, of course, to write it like this. If it doesn't equal that, draw it, right? But I find it's a bit cleaner to just be like continue if it's that. So let's see if that works. 
No. Okay, so we'd probably pattern it out with FF then. So this would be FF, FF, 0, 0, FF. So it's going to be a 32-bit kind of value. And there you go. You can see that we now have our character and we have like a transparent background, right? Um, like we can see the pixels kind of changing behind our player. And that's probably going to look terrible with like YouTube compression, but you get what you get. <laughs> Maybe I should do like live presentations feel like a stadium with people and just teach this kind of stuff. Um, and then you can see it live where you won't see any video compression. That'll be exciting. So yeah, that's basically the, the basics. Like that's honestly like that's the basics. We can now read in indi individual sprites. You can see that we avoided doing it the way that we did in, in the Java version, which was by like every single sprite, you know, copying uh, the pixels from the sprite sheet into its own buffer for some reason. It doesn't need that. It can just reference the existing ones. Uh, the existing like single buffer, which is the whole sprite sheet, and just copy whatever it needs um, on demand. Now, there w this was a bit finicky. Like you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So what we could do is definitely provide an API for that um, if we wanted to again, which I don't know if we do want to. Um, but you could even write like a, a function, you know, being like copy, you know, copy from sprite sheet to this buffer, and it would kind of automatically implement that. All you have to do is give it a coordinate and an offset within the original buffer. So that's also possible. That's very possible. And then you could kind of implement the for loop inside that function. Lots of ways to kind of simplify this and expand this. Um, and I guess I probably will commit this. I'll try and commit this and I'll have a link to it in the description below. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying the series so far, to be honest. It's bringing back lots of memories and it's so fun to revise this stuff. Kind of like me in the future, you know, me now having learned like everything that I learned, you know, looking looking at this stuff and implementing this. It's like, you know, just looking at it from a whole different perspective, from a whole different, from a whole new light, which is really cool. So I hope you guys are enjoying this series as well. If you have any questions, as always, just leave them in the comments below. I'll try and kind of address them in the next episode. But yeah, I think next time we'll actually implement that screen class and we'll maybe try and draw like a map of tiles or something like that, or at least we'll progress into that into that direction. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to check out Brilliant. Link in the description below and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.